Sega wanted these games on the Genesis and Master System so bad they made the ports themselves. Joystick. Video game systems used to be heavily curated by the companies that made the game consoles. Sega used to identify games that they wanted on their systems. For a variety of reasons, several game developers would okay to have their games on the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive platform, but they didn't want to develop and publish it themselves. So, Sega licensed many original games and personally ported them to their 8-bit and 16-bit home game systems. I guess it made sense for the original game developers because they didn't have anything to do except to cash the royalty checks from Sega. Sega made their own versions and published it. I always thought it was a little weird that Strider and Ghouls and Ghosts were brought to the Sega Genesis by Sega. but. We didn't care at the time, we just wanted good games on our home Sega systems. The following games were originally mostly developed as arcade or home computer games, but were personally brought to the Sega Genesis and Master System platformers by Sega themselves. My Kitty Guy here wanted me to let you know that we make awesome videos like this each week. So make sure that you are subscribed to this channel so you don't miss them. Now. Onto the games. Strider for Genesis. Sega and Capcom were friendly rivals in the arcade scene and both had arcade boards that were based on the Motorola 68000 processor line. The Sega 16 board and the Capcom CPS1 board. So when Sega introduced their 16-bit home video game system, the Mega Drive Genesis, what they wanted to do is show off its power by bringing home some graphically impressive Capcom arcade games that shared the same CPU architecture. Strider is an over-the-top high-speed side-scrolling action game featuring a ninja-like hero who has a previously unprecedented amount of fluidity and movement. Set in a sci-fi fantasy action world, it features an energy sword that he can swing very very fast and cut through bad guys of all sorts while flipping around and clinging to walls and being super stylish and cool. Sega themselves licensed and ported this game and used their brand new 8 megabit cartridge, which is now 1 megabyte. This provided a very convincing game that consumers could easily look at and tell themselves that there is no way that this could have been possible on the 8-bit Nintendo hardware of the day. Capcom did make a Strider game for Nintendo's 8-bit hardware, but instead chose to make it an expanded action role-playing game with hints of Metroidvania, instead of just a home version of their completely action-oriented arcade hit. Technically, Strider for NES was a new game that was inspired by the arcade game, but the Sega-developed and Sega-published Genesis game was a licensed port of the actual Capcom arcade game. Sega's port of Strider is a masterclass on how you can bring a complex game home on less powerful home hardware and still be able to capture all the flavor and panache of the high-energy arcade game. Ghouls and Ghosts for Genesis and Master System Ghouls and Ghosts, known as Dai Makamura, is a side-scrolling platform action game by Capcom and it is the sequel to Ghosts and Goblins and the second game in the game series. Sega would handle their own conversion of Ghouls and Ghosts programmed by none other than Sonic the Hedgehog designer Yuji Naka in 1989 and then they would release a Master System version made by Arc System Works in 1990 because Sega still had a pretty big 8-bit market and fan base for the Sega Master System in Europe and South America, especially Brazil. Brazil loved the Master System. Ghouls and Ghosts is widely regarded as a masterpiece, especially the Sega version. Brutally difficult gameplay had really amazing animation and plays quite well, and it handles well so you can blame yourself when you are faced with the brutal difficulty. In 1989, seeing Ghouls and Ghosts on the Sega Genesis and then contrasting it with Ghosts and Goblins on the Nintendo's 8-bit hardware really drove home just how uniquely powerful Sega's home offering was 
It's no wonder why Sega wanted to personally bring this bad boy home to their game systems. Double Dragon for Master System Double Dragon was an arcade hit and it really brought home the concept of side-scrolling beat-em-up action and featured two heroes setting off to beat up a ton of martial arts bad guys. However, Technos was limited with the simpler MMC1 memory mapper chip with the NES slash Famicom version of Double Dragon, and they were only able to have single player gameplay, which is a shame because the game is called Double Dragon, and it explicitly mentions two badasses beating up bad guys. Sega set out to show up Nintendo yet again by making an 8-bit Master System version of Double Dragon that allowed two-player simultaneous action and had two martial arts badasses setting off to beat up bad guys. The Master System version of Double Dragon is tough, but it is graphically impressive, and Sega themselves were responsible for bringing all the action home. Mercs for Genesis Another Capcom CPS arcade powerhouse was Mercs, which was a vertically scrolling shooting action game, but instead of controlling a spaceship, you controlled a super soldier running around shooting bad guys. Technically, this is a continuation of the Commando game series that Capcom started in the arcades before bringing it to the NES and Famicom. Mercs in the arcade was a Tate mode game, with a vertically oriented 3x4 screen and Sega brought it home by only slightly modifying the screen with a bar on the right hand side and then only slightly zoomed in because back in the day only crazy people would turn their TVs on their side. It was pretty technically impressive that Mercs could have drivable vehicles, destructible environments, and a big enemy boss that you could blow up. It is full of a lot of classic Capcom action. Mercs came home to the Sega Genesis with most of the arcade action intact, however it was turned into a single player game, while the arcade game featured up to three players at the same time. There also was a new home mode which featured new missions and weapon shops. Even if it didn't feature multiple players at the same time, it was still pretty technically impressive to have this level of running and gunning awesomeness on the Sega Genesis. The promise of trying to bring home the arcade hits was finally getting pretty close to being realized with the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive. Forgotten Worlds for Genesis Forgotten Worlds was a very interesting arcade game that was a horizontal shooter, but instead of a spaceship, it starred two muscle-bound dudes who could fly and shoot bad guys in any direction using a joystick on the left and a circular spinner on the right to aim. This was long before there were a lot of twin arcade shooters besides Robotron 284, so you would not think that it would translate well into a Sega Genesis home game. However, they were able to simulate the spinning by having a rotate left and rotate right button that had some acceleration to spin faster and slower based on how long you held the button. There also is the option to have auto fire so you can keep your hands free to rotate and fly your muscle dude. The Genesis port had almost all the detailed animation and Capcom styled graphics of the CPS1 arcade game and the two person co-op play is intact and is a blast. It has seven of the nine stages of the arcade game and I think it is a shame that Capcom never followed up with a sequel to Forgotten Worlds. Forgotten Worlds is not long, but it is a great couch co-op shooter that Sega themselves brought to the Genesis early on in late 1989, proving that Genesis does what Nintendo don't in bringing home real awesome Capcom arcade action. Gavellius for Master System Compile is one of my favorite game developers that had a very close relationship with Sega during the 1980s and they made an action role-playing game for the MSX computer system. It not only took inspiration from The Legend of Zelda but The Legend of Zelda 2 in that it had both over-the-head action stages as well as side-scrolling action stages. Compile had a very close relationship with Sega, and there was a version released on the Sega Master System. 
It is not clear if Sega did the reprogramming of it themselves and published it, or if Compiled did it with Sega's supervision, who later published it. By viewing the production credits, it looks like Compile actually ported their own game to the Master System under Sega's direction and funding. But if you look at the main screen, it says Reprogrammed Game Copyright to Sega 1988. Sega's relationship with Compile is a bit convoluted, such as HAL Laboratories' relationship with Nintendo. The line between second-party companies and third-party companies can be blurry, but Govelius is a really excellent action role-playing game, and it is full of classic Sega 8-bit feels. It goes down as one of the best games on the Master System. Tetris for Mega Drive. If you ever have a free evening, I happily recommend that you watch Tetris the Movie on Apple TV+. It covers the dramatized fight to bring Tetris to the West, and Sega sort of had some questionable legal access to the arcade rights to Tetris, and then they produced a Sega Mega Drive version, which was all ready to go in 1989, and then it was cancelled, probably when Nintendo officially got their rights to Tetris lined up, so the Mega Drive version of Tetris goes right up there with the Tengen NES version of Tetris, but with a much less less degree of notoriety. This version was developed by Sega themselves, but it was never published officially until the release of the Sega Mega Drive Mini some decades later. Art of Fighting for Sega Genesis I guess Sega didn't want to be left out of the fighting game market, and they developed a home port of the Neo Geo arcade game Art of Fighting. It's actually a pretty decent home port of the game, but without the scaling and very big characters that you see on the Neo Geo version. But the character sprites are reasonably sized and very well animated. Personally, I think the music sounds great on the Sega Genesis hardware. Cyberball for Genesis Originally, this was an Atari arcade game, but then the Sega Genesis port was made by Sega themselves. It is the sport of American hand egg, which was deceptively called football, set in the far future of the 21st century, where instead of having overpaid humanoids, they are robots who play the game of American hand egg. It is a fast and okay game for sports ball, but one amusing thing about it is one of the reasons why you need to get a first down is that if you don't, the ball will explode and destroy your player robot player thingy. Choplifter for Master System Choplifter by Dan Gorlin was an Apple II computer game hit from 1982, and Sega licensed their rights to turn it into an arcade game, an SG-1000 game, and eventually a Sega Mark III Master System game. Sega ported Choplifter to the Master System, and in doing so, they made a profound statement on the brutality and inhumanity of war. You play an American helicopter pilot who must fly behind enemy lines, blow the doors off a POW camp, and try to rescue as many prisoners as possible before they are killed by enemy forces, or die in a fiery crash as your helicopter is shot down. It is quick, action-packed, and brutal. And there are always more prisoners of war to help liberate, and the fighting continues day after day until everyone is dead. It is a surprisingly fun and depressing game at the same time. Choplifter is encapsulated brutality in 8-bit plastic and silicon, brought to you by Sega. Choplifter for Sega SG-1000 There is a very well put together SG-1000 port of Choplifter. I really find it amusing to see so many American developed PC games being ported to an obscure Japanese game system which never came out in my part of the world. Over the years I've been resisting the urge to try to collect Sega SG-1000 games because they're already pretty rare and obscure in Japan let alone over here, but at least through the miracle of emulation and FPGA, I present to you Choplifter for the Sega SG-1000. Cheeky Cheeky Boys Cheeky Cheeky Boys was a side-scrolling jumping platform game released in arcades by Capcom. 
Sega hired Visco to make a Genesis Mega Drive version, and then it was published by Sega, with the label right there reprogrammed by Sega on the home screen. Apparently, that can cover additional companies that were hired by Sega to make the port. Sega would eventually go on to purchase Visco, so I'll allow it here. It is a pretty fun and colorful CPS-1 game, and the Sega Genesis version has pretty decent graphics and animation. It is bright and fun. It's not the most innovative game in the world, but it's a deliciously retro throwback, and it hits a lot better now in 2024 than it originally did in 1993. Darwin 4081 for Sega Mega Drive. It is a pretty tough vertical shooter. Originally made by Data East, the arcade style vertical shooter with Tate mode formatting was left in Japan. It is pretty hard with Zevius influences for bombing the ground. Strangely, I don't know why Sega chose to port this game to their platform. It's not bad, but it's not mind blowing. But I'm not complaining that they did this to bring this game out, but I just don't exactly get their motivation to do so. But when it comes to retro video games, Strange Curiosities is where this channel comes in. World Heroes for Genesis Sega Midwest Development Division was actually based in Chicago, so it's a little strange to see them do a Sega Genesis Mega Drive port of the Neo Geo World Heroes game. I guess it's strange to think that we now live in a time where you can easily run Neo Geo games in software emulators or FPGA, but at a time, a port of this game to less powerful hardware was the only way that you could realistically think to ever be able to afford to play it at home. It's surprisingly fluid and well animated and not as choppy as you would think for such a significant downgrade. Also, it plays like a pretty decent fighting game or a Japanese developed game being ported to Sega Genesis by a team of Americans. It's hard for modern gamers to wrap their heads around just how ridiculously popular fighting games were in the mid 90s after the success of Street Fighter 2. Pretty much every single competently well animated fighting game was almost guaranteed to sell cartridges. Special mention, Popful Mail for Sega CD was a side-scrolling action-adventure role-playing game featuring a sword-wielding protagonist and many hand-drawn animated cutscenes. Originally, it was an NEC PC game by Nihon Falcom and Sega themselves made a Sega Mega Drive Sega CD version and intended to turn it into a Sonic the Hedgehog related game starring a new hero which is a little weird considering it is a completely different genre than all of the Sonic the Hedgehog games at that point. But plans to do that fell through and working designs took over the Sega produced version and actually finished it. I actually think it's pretty crazy when you consider that the vast differences between the gameplay, art styles, and everything between Sonic the Hedgehog and Popful Mail. Physical copies of this game are quite expensive. Nowadays, Nintendo is known as a happy, friendly company that makes fun games enjoyed by families and all. But in the 1980s, some of their corporate practices were brutal and monopolistic. One thing that they would do is impose tight restrictions on third-party developers who made games for the NES, and if they ran afoul of Nintendo, you might not get your games approved. A lot of developers just sucked it up because Nintendo was the 900-pound gorilla who had over 95% of the market during the 8-bit era in North America. Developers put up with this because there was such a phenomenally large amount of money to be made in the American video game market on the NES. So Capcom didn't feel comfortable being a direct developer for Sega's rival systems until the Genesis itself became much more established and they didn't fear retaliation from Nintendo quite so much. They would make different games based on their arcade hardware for Nintendo's platforms. 
That is one of the reasons why Strider and Bionic Commando for the NES are fundamentally very different games. And then they would license the rights to Sega to develop their own home console versions and publish them themselves. This gave Capcom plausible deniability because they could tell Nintendo that these were different games using the same IP. This gave Capcom plausible deniability because they could tell Nintendo that these were different games using the same IP. Ironically, this actually really helped the quality of some of the games because Sega was quite good at bringing games to their home systems. And when Capcom and Konami were confident enough to become official Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive developers, they often created, and I got a cat. And when Capcom and Konami were confident enough to become official Sega developers, they often created entirely new games with their own development teams and produced some real bangers such as Castlevania Bloodlines, Contra Hardcore, and others. Nintendo has this cute and cuddly appearance and is known for making fun family-friendly games, but back in the 1980s with Hiroshi Yamauchi at Nintendo of Japan, and Arakawa and Howard Lincoln at Nintendo of America, they went from a scrappy underdog at the start of the 1980s to almost totally dominating the entire video game industry by the end of the decade. And they didn't get that way by being nice to their competition. They have mellowed quite a bit since then, but I wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of Nintendo back in the 1980s. Sega lived to tell the tale, but they got out of the console wars with some battle scars worthy of Kiru of the Walk Like a Dragon games. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on future awesome videos that are now being released on Saturday morning at 9am. This is 8-Bit Joystick. Stay awesome. Play retro.